What's up, guys? You're listening to another episode of Selling on Amazon with Andy Isom. In this episode, we're going to talk about how liquid death exploded into a saturated bottled water market. If you guys know me, you know that I love listening to podcasts just as much as I love recording them for you guys. It's been my go to at the gym when I work out in the mornings. I get in, you know, a full hour of podcast episode listening from some of my favorite shows out there. One of them being How I Built This, hosted by Guy Raz. And what I love about that uh, podcast, shout out to uh, those guys over there, is one, they have a a great professional show, right? And uh, it's very well produced. The audio is always on point. So I've definitely learned and tried to take away a lot from their show and what Guy has, has built over the years and tried to implement some of those practices into my own podcast. But uh, more than that, I would say, is the quality of guests that they get on that show. If you're looking to learn from some of the biggest and best founders in the world, that is the podcast to listen to. I mean, Guy is interviewing, you know, the CEOs of all the biggest companies that you've heard of, and uh, they're getting deep into like the origin stories and the struggles that these founders faced to start their companies. Now, I've listened to dozens of episodes from How I Built This, and I don't want to spend, you know, this full episode like regurgitating the entire episode. Obviously, you guys can go look it up. It's the episode with Mike Cesario, the founder of Liquid Death. But that brand, that story, that example to me is one of the most inspiring that I've ever heard. Because if you think about, and again, you can go listen to the episode and kind of hear some of the details behind his startup story and his history. He was trying to start, or he did start, right? A bottled water company. One of the most basic products on earth. Other than like selling a bag of air, I don't think it gets more basic than selling a bottle of water. I really don't. I don't think there's any other product on earth, business, idea on earth, more basic than selling water. The fact that he was able to, like recently, right? Within the last five years, I think, right? If I'm I'm trying to remember the dates correctly. Essentially, right, right before COVID, build a brand new company in the bottled water space up to $100 million a year in this short time frame is absolutely mind blowing to me. So just to kind of go over some of, uh, again, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of recap the, the the episode is long. They do great interviews, the long interviews. So I'm just going to highlight some of the story, but I won't give away any of the like super nitty gritty fun uh, details. But again, I'm going to try to kind of relate this to what we're trying to do, right? Cause we're trying to build our own brands, maybe not necessarily a bottled water brand, but there's so many lessons in that example that I think we can apply and we can learn from just really shape our mindset as we work to build our own brands. Now, quick pause. I'm not sponsored by, by liquid death by any means. Gosh, I wish I were. If you guys want to sponsor me, I'm happy. I buy all of liquid deaths, uh, flavored sparkling water, by the way, I'm I'm a big flavored sparkling water guy, but liquid death guys is way better than like all those other brands, Le LaCroix, the whatever other, you know, sparklings, whatever. Liquid Death by far is the goat and they've come out with an amazing product. So Severed Lime, by the way, one of my top faves. I would say second Convicted Melon. I've tried them all. The mango one's good. The grape, I think it's the grape one. There's a bunch of good ones. No, no, grape is different. Different brand. I'm getting my brands confused, but I've got a bunch of good ones. So go check them out if you're into uh, the flavored sparkling, sparkling water. Back to the show after that small commercial break, which again, I'm definitely not getting paid for by any means to say that, but let's talk about the origin of liquid death. And we're going to try, I'm going to break this into seven little kind of chapters. Okay. We're going to break this episode into seven little chapters. Again, kind of building off of Mike Cesario's journey of founding liquid death. And again, this is based off that episode I listened to last week from how I built this. So the origin of liquid death Mike came up with the idea of liquid death by asking himself, what is the dumbest possible idea we could have when it comes to like selling, selling a beverage, selling water. In fact, in the episode that he goes into, like he had some previous history in alcohol and another brand that he was starting in the alcohol space. But speaking specifically of water, 
the bottled water market up to this point was water brands like, you know, Arrowhead, Dasani, you know, the other bottled water, Crystal guys or whatever they are. But they're all just in plastic bottles. And it's water. Like, right? There's not much you, you can't really change water. It's, it comes from Mountain Spring. Okay. So he's like, what's the dumbest thing we could possibly do to brand water? And he came up with the idea of branding it as if it was going to kill you. Like as if it was poison. The healthiest thing on earth that we can drink, essentially, right? Branding it as if it would kill you. Hence the name Liquid Death. Hence the uh, kind of skull. It has like an interesting like kind of dying skull. You guys can look it up. Logo. And then the font also, he was going off of when he talks about, you know, kind of creating the branding and the design and the fonts. He was kind of going off of like a cross between beer and and poison. He wanted it to look like someone who was drinking water. It looked, he wanted it to look like they were drinking something they shouldn't be drinking, right? Like some sort of alcoholic beverage that was going to kill you. Hence again, the font and the skull and everything and calling it liquid death. And I remember guys, when I saw liquid death for the first time, I don't, I I, I honestly, I can't remember where, but I do remember, you know, like when I first kind of saw it and I was like, liquid death. That's like, that's kind of weird. What is that? And then once I found out that it was water, I was like, wait, what? What? Like, why is this water company called liquid death? And I literally just kind of had that like confusion of like, what are they, what are they doing? But then like right after that moment, that was like my initial like thought is like, wait, what? It's water. But then it like kind of dawned on me and I kind of had one of those Oh, that is brilliant because I always look at stuff now from like a marketing, branding, business perspective. And I remember like just kind of having that bing light bulb go off like, Andy, that is, that's one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. Like I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of like, oh, I'm going to start a bottled water company, but put, make it look like an alcohol beverage can and call it liquid death. It's so absurd that it's incredible. And again, that's kind of what Mike was trying to do. And Mike also had a background in advertising. And so he was doing stuff like this, even, you know, when he was working for other companies, helping come up with ad creatives and messaging and content, he was always looking for, you know, what is going to be the shock factor? And I think that applies so much to, to what we're trying to do today is I think we get caught up trying to do what everyone else is doing, that we're scared to go against the grain. I see this not only like on Amazon with Amazon products, but I see it in like other business models, you know, content creation and, you know, influencers and coaches like me, right, who are posting on social media videos and tutorials and things is we see like something maybe that works for someone else or, oh, all these people are posting this type of thing and they're really successful. So I'm just going to do exactly what they're doing. We're scared to like venture off and try our own thing or do something dramatically opposite of what's the proven here's how you build a funnel that actually works. And so we get so caught up in like trying to just copy and mimic what success has been up to now that we never really find our own way. And I think you could say that, you know, kind of applying this back to bottled water is like, he could have been like, yeah, I'm going to sell bottled water. Well, what sells? Dasani sells, Arrowhead sells, whatever the other brands are. And it's just water in a plastic bottle and you got the little wrapper and like that works. Obviously it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And clearly those brands are making a lot of money. So like, why not just do that? But the lesson again was he wasn't afraid to go against the norm and really do something different. So dramatically different. Again, he asked himself, what is the dumbest idea we could possibly have? And let me see if that will work. So kind of the second chapter here are the challenges of starting the business. Previous uh, business history from Mike was he actually was started starting up an alcohol brand and he realized there were so many regulations with alcohol and he ran into so many roadblocks and it was like such a headache for him that uh he vowed actually that in his next business endeavor he was going to do something that didn't have that type of regulation which is one of the reasons he kind of got into the water market but as far as challenges go he knew that if he was going to build a a a bottled water or canned water right his stuff's canned liquid death is in a can It was going to require a lot of capital, right? A lot of money to get that thing off the ground and very strategic marketing and that the branding was going to be everything because again, it's water. 
It's, I mean, obviously now he's got flavored water. So there's that element of differentiation for the product itself. Originally, it's just water. There's not much you can do to change water. You can change where you get it from. Do I get it from a mountain? Do I get it from, I don't know, the tap? Other than that, it's water. So what he knew is like branding is going to be everything if I'm going to succeed in the market for water. So he was going to have to invest heavily into branding, brand awareness, obviously putting it in a can versus being in a, a bottled water. And, and so that's where he really focused was, okay, I really, really, really have to put a strong emphasis on branding. So moving into chapter three, that kind of goes into this idea of creativity and viral marketing. Now, Mike did something super smart that I think we can apply to our own brands and think about for our own products is he actually created a video ad before the product even existed, before Liquid Death was even made. He created a video as if it was a thing. You know, I don't remember the exact script, but you can get and listen to the episode. And he says like, you know, we made this ad. I think it's like wife and kid were in it. And it was talking about how it was liquid death, da, 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 da. And there was like showed a guy who was like dying and how water was, you know, the uh, a reason for death in so many other ways of life that drinking it is, also, you know, and it was like kind of this funny play on how water actually kills people. And he put it on, on uh, Facebook and he, you know, ran it as an ad and he started to get Facebook followers to his page. And he got a ton of hate. I mean, we're not hatred, but he got a ton of doubt. Like people are like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like, this is so dumb. But he got a bunch of followers to his page to where people were even asking like, hey, how do I get this? Can we buy this? Is this really a thing? So he was testing out whether or not that branding concept, whether that idea would even have any legs if he were to go spend the money to create it. Because again, he knew if I'm going to go can water, my MOQ, my minimum order quantity is going to be super high. I think he quoted it in the show as like 200,000 bottles or cans for a first run. That's a big investment to get things started. So he's like, I'm going to go see if this even would be interesting to people on social media for a couple thousand bucks before I go spend a couple million dollars to make this thing real. So super smart there. And, and guys, we can do this with our own products using research companies like PicFu. And I'm not being sponsored to say that. But we use PicFu for clients that we manage accounts and brands and products for. We run PicFu polls for them all the time because we want to know like what listing is going to convert better, what product idea is going to convert better, what price point is going to convert better. We throw a, f- a couple hundred bucks behind it and then we know, hey, this is direction we should be taking or this is like this is a bad direction. I'd rather spend a hundred bucks, 200 bucks to gather data and know like this is going to work or not work. Then go spend $2,000 on inventory and be like, oh crap, I can't sell this. This is not selling at all, right? So by again, spending a couple thousand bucks up front, Mike potentially saved himself millions of dollars of failure down the road. Moving to chapter four here. This is a chapter of persistence and innovation. Mike, he encountered a lot of hurdles. Again, I'm trying not to like give away too much or or say too many details, right? I don't want to just copy paste the entire episode, but he encountered a lot of hurdles. And the biggest hurdle he faced was he could not find a company that could can water. Now, the way that the bottled water industry works is in order to make it a viable business model, you have to bottle the water at the source. So wherever the water is coming from, a spring in some Arrowhead Mountain, wherever it is, it is pulled from the spring, right, where they have their facility and then bottled right there on the spot. Because financially, to make sense and be competitive in the market for bottled water, You can't get water, put it in big tanker trucks, drive them across this country, get them bottled somewhere else, drive like that's not that cuts way too much into the margins to where you can't sell bottled water in that market. Right. You think about how much is bottled water, a dollar or even like it's like 25 cents to maybe like five bucks for Fiji water. Right. But still, it's just not it's not viable for most companies. So he actually had to go to Austria. He found a company in Austria. In Europe. That would can water. But then the issue became, okay, that's great. You can can water at the source in Austria, but now I got to ship water from Austria to the United States. Like most bottled water in the United States is bottled in the, in the United States. Or, or if it's like Fiji water, it's five bucks a bottle, right? And he wasn't trying to create a $5 bottle of plastic water. He wanted, you know, to see his vision of a can and the branding and everything. So he went for it. He's like, hey, this is what I got to do. And so I'm going to do it. 
I'm going to do it. I'm going to can water. I'm going to be one of the first brands to actually can water. And I'm going to do my branding that I tested out right with my Facebook ads. And I'm going to, I'm going to take that risk and take that chance and just, and just figure it out as we go. Now, kind of moving into, now we're kind of moving into like the success chapters, right? So chapter five, I would say is kind of like the branding and product success. This is again, just kind of recapping how branding was everything for his product. Taste, like when it comes down to like taste of water, yeah, it plays a little bit of a factor. But like most people, honestly, if you did like a blind taste test and you put a whole bunch of bottled water next to each other, you wouldn't really be able to tell much of a difference. You'd be like, oh yeah, these are all kind of good. So it really comes down to branding. It really comes down to having a good brand and really connecting with that customer because for stuff like bottled water, kind of once you get a customer, you, you kind of get a customer. Like if you think about people you know or maybe yourself, like most likely, un- unless you're like traveling, because sometimes when I travel and I'm at the airport, I'm like, I'm just buying the cheapest one. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, like if you're someone who consistently buys bottled water, chances are you probably buy the same brand every time, whether it's where you shop or a brand you like, or maybe you do like to taste a little bit better. But it's like, you know, you kind of have a, a go-to. But for something like Liquid Death, it's such a brand play. We're like, that is, that, that is a differentiator is like, you're walking around, you know, holding a can of liquid death and everyone's looking at you like, is that dude like drinking a beer? Or like, you're like, no, dude, this is actually just water. <laughs> and it's like kind of cool, right? It's kind of cool to drink liquid death. I'm not going to lie. I actually feel kind of edgy drinking liquid death, knowing it's literally sparkling water, but the tall, you know, the tall, thin can, the 20 ounce can the colors, the logo, the branding, everything. It again, it kind of like makes you feel a little edgy. And I'm someone who doesn't drink alcohol. Like I don't drink alcoholic beverages. So for me, again, it's like even more exaggerated because I'm like, oh, I uh, feel a little rebellious with my liquid death. (laughs) So it's like almost fun, right? So they've created that emotion with their branding. And that's what really helped them stand out, right? In a saturated market, you go to the bottled water section at the grocery store and you got a whole bunch of just bottles of the, you know, it's kind of plain, it's a picture of a mountain, it has a branding. And then you see liquid desk boxes and it has like the really crazy colors and the design and it just really pops. It really stands out. It's just different. And people, I think a lot of people are gravitating toward it because they're like, this is fun. This is different. This makes you feel different than just drinking some plain, whatever bottle of water. So once he was able to write, get his, get his product out there again with a lot of, you know, capital and you know he was able to raise money to really scale this thing up over the last few years he saw explosive growth right chapter six i would say is growth and expansion over the last couple years has seen this vision take off and people start to adopt this and invest more and more money into the business he saw explosive growth focused solely on on his liquid death company just went full hardcore into online marketing amazon you know, all the different distribution channels he could to reach a wider audience. And I kind of think the the lesson here is when it's time to go all in, guys, you got to go all in. If you truly want this to be something spectacular, you got to go all in. I see too, way too many people. I'm not going to lie. I felt this way about my own brands and own businesses myself. And I'm still someone who at times struggles to take risks, financial risks. When we say go all in, we're talking about financial investments, right? So I'm someone who still like hesitates to go all in on things because I get scared. I get nervous. Like, what if it doesn't work, right? What if I lose this money? Like, is this a dumb decision? But if you truly want to have spectacular results and do something spectacular, you have to be willing to jump. Like you have to be willing to take those risks. Could liquid death be like a fun, little, successful, profitable business? Sure. Like if he didn't invest and get VC money and no raise millions of of dollars in in investment capital. Could he have like kind of grown it from friends and family, right? Yeah, but it wouldn't be the brand it is today. It wouldn't be a hundred million dollar company. And I'm not saying like, oh, you have to build a hundred million dollar company or you're a failure. Absolutely not. I'm just saying like, if your ambition is to like change the world or like do something amazing for yourself, for your family, right? You got to be willing to really believe in it And really, when it's time to go all in, go all in. I'm kind of going back to episode 314. One of, again, still to this day, one of, I think, the best episodes, most important episodes I've ever recorded. Talking about so many people that are in this situation where maybe they had a great product idea. It was something they were passionate about. They're excited. They launch, they sell. 
And yeah, they're selling a few thousand bucks here and there, 3,000, 5,000, maybe 7,000 bucks a month, but they've been selling for a year. Maybe even they hit $100,000 in sales. Awesome. Good for you. Like, right. But you're just struggling to reach profitability, struggling to reorder inventory. You're struggling to release new SKUs because you got put, put some more money on your credit card. You just really can't get over that hump. It's because you're stuck in that cash flow conundrum, what I call it in that episode, but you're not going to experience that explosive growth that you deserve. That's literally on the other side of that hill because you're just not willing to take that leap of faith, that risk to get over that hill and slide down the other side. Again, I'm going to shout out kind of to wrap this up. We'll wrap this up with chapter seven here, which I would say like revenue company evolution, the end of the episode, right? Seven years after they've launched liquid death, it's a water company. They're an entertainment company, annual revenue over a hundred million dollars. Guys, this is in a bottled water industry that they disrupted. One of the most saturated price competitive markets in the world, right? How do you differentiate water other than from branding? It's almost insanity to even attempt that, to try to do that, what he did. But he proved how unconventional ideas, right? Thinking differently than everyone else thinks, being willing to do something crazy that no one else is willing to do or try, being creative, really like thinking, what could I possibly do that is so absurd that people would actually love it? And then just persisting. I don't have the money to start a bottle of water company. Find people who believe in you. Find ways to test the model before you go and raise it. Prove to people, look, I've proved, I've run this. I've run these polls. I've run, this works. Find investors. Find someone who can make it happen. Maybe it's not in the United States. Maybe it's not in China. Maybe it's in Austria, but you don't give up until you find someone who can make it happen. And yeah, maybe it's not the ideal situation right off the bat, but you make it happen and then you figure it out. Figure out how to make it better. Figure out how to improve. Figure out how to fix it. And then just be willing to reinvest and persist long enough. Like maybe you won't build a $100 million brand in seven years, but like don't think that, oh, in six months or selling on Amazon for 12 months is going to absolutely change your life. Like could it? Maybe. Yeah, I've seen it. But I think having more realistic expectations of kind of what it's going to take to actually change your life is going to lead you to make better decisions for the long term, but also to take the risks necessary to get there. Moving forward, guys, like this is this is so much more my focus is not thinking about, you know, selling stuff on Amazon from like a product perspective of like, ah, well, this one product it's going to change my life. I'm going to sell this one random knickknack and make a bajillion dollars. No, 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 no. We got to start a brand. We're going to start a movement. We, we understand that like, yeah, not every product is going to absolutely crush it. That's okay. We're in this for the long haul. We're ready to take those risks. We only got one life to live. So, you know, if I got to grind it out, if I got to hustle, if I got to borrow money, if I got to take a loan, if I got to find investors, if I got to find partners to make my ideas, my visions, my dreams come to life, then by golly, I'm going to do it. And if I fail and it, the business comes crashing down to earth and I got to sell my cars and you know, whatever, then I'll do it. Like I'll, I'll, I'll do what it takes. I'll get back up. I'll get back up, figure it out and make it happen again. This is the same thing I've told myself guys every single day since I quit my full-time job. To those of you out there who have a full-time job, you know, kind of that sense of peace and security. I shouldn't maybe not say peace, but like that sense of security you feel because there's someone out there that's sending you a paycheck every two weeks or however often you get paid. Oh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, obviously you got to perform and or, or you're going to get fired. But like at the end of the day, like you can go to your office or if you're working from home, you dink around, dink around. And like, as long as you get your shiz done, like you're going to get paid. You know, like you kind of feel like I'm just comfortable. Life is comfortable. Right. But since being my own boss, my life has drastically improved for the better. Are there challenges? Absolutely. I wake up every day with the burden of, I am it. I am it. My wife doesn't work. My wife stays at home. She's a stay-at-home mom now, which is what her dream job was. So she's living out her dream. I have kids. My kids are home. We live in a beautiful house. We have everything we could ever need. But, you know, I carry that passion, that fire of, I am my business. If I don't work, the business don't, like, if I don't execute, if I don't work, if I don't take the risks, like, my business will only grow as much as my ambition and passion allows it to grow. I'm not relying on my boss. Like, Oh, Hey boss, hopefully you grow the company so I can get a pay raise. Like, no, I am the company. So that is something that's beautiful about getting into this. Right. And, and looking at life from this perspective is I'm going to die. I will die someday. 
Hopefully it's a long ways away, but I have no idea when that is. It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. It could be in 10, 50 years, but I will die. And so I only get to live on this earth one time, right? I only get to live this life one time and I'm not getting any younger. That's for sure. Right. Thankfully, I'm still in my younger years, move around still pretty good. But reminding myself of that, it really helps me see like, I just, I just don't want to live an average life. I just don't. I'm just not that personality. And some people are, and that's okay. I'm not trying to hate on that. Like, I just don't want to live an average life. I'm too ambitious. I feel like I was too blessed. I was blessed to, you know, be born in the family I was born into, live the life experiences I've lived, gain the knowledge I've gained. I'm too blessed to just not take advantage of it is I guess what I'm getting to. So when I get scared, when I get nervous about like making a decision for one of my right various businesses, Amazon, my own businesses, right? Like, should I do that? Should I try it? Should I spend that money? Should I hire this person to take this opportunity or not? Like, I just remind myself like, hey, this is your life, right? You get one of them. And I ain't trying to like make it to my deathbed and be like, dang, I wish I would have, I wish I would have tried that. I wish I had invested the money. I wish I would have taken that opportunity, see what I could have built out of it, see where I could have taken that thing. And I think that's really helped me. I think that's really helped me kind of continue to progress, honestly, continue to grow every year. My businesses have grown. God willing, they're going to keep growing every year. But uh, if they don't, guess what? I'm going to get back up, dust my shoulders off and get right back to it. I've kind of made a personal vow to myself. I will never go back to a nine to five. And again, sometimes that scares me because I'm like, well, what if my business fails or what if this, 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 this? I, I can make it happen. I know now that like 80% of this guys is just mental. 80% of you guys building your successful brands and everything. It's mental. Everything is figure outable. So I'll figure it out and you'll figure it out too. So if something's not going right for your business or wherever you're at or your life, like if you're willing to get up and keep persevering, you will figure it out. You just got to build up that conviction, that passion, that fire to not live a normal average life. If that is the life that you feel you're meant to live, meaning a different life, right? So sorry, kind of preachy there, <laughs> kind of preachy there at the end. Honestly, it was weird. I felt like I was talking more to myself than to you guys right there at the end of that episode. So I might have to like re-listen to this one when I'm in need of a, of a uh, motivation pep talk. All right, guys, go check out that episode. Again, how I built this with Guy Raz. You can find it on any podcast app. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of all time. One of my heroes in the uh, branding business building space. For sure, the story of liquid death. Guys, once again, I'm Andy. You're listening to Selling on Amazon with Andy Isom. We'll see you in the next episode.